Hey guys, it's Landon Blake from Redefined Horizons, and this is another whiteboard talk slash teaching Tuesday video. So in the last video, we went through chapter one of the book on land tenure. In this video, we're going to go through chapter two. So let's jump right into some uh, key concepts of chapter two of the book. So first key concept is uh, more about land tenure. Okay, so uh, we've got a definition here of land tenure and some principles. Okay, so let's write down this first key concept. Okay, so here's our first key concept in chapter two. Land tenure is a set of rules about land. And we touched on that in chapter one. Remember we said a cadastral system is land tenure. It's the rules plus a system to register information about land when it's bought and sold, who owns it. So we're building now on this concept of land tenure. Set of rules or an institution, the book calls it, about land. So a group of people get together, like, you know, in a society and they say, all right, here's the rules that we're going to use to govern land. And the reason we do that is because we don't want people, uh, you know, committing atrocities with baseball bats and taking land. We want a system of legal rules that substitutes for physical violence. Makes us all wealthier, plus we don't get hit with baseball bats. So land tenure is that set of rules about land. So rules about land. Look over here. We're going to talk about it. Okay. What does that include? Who gets the land? How is land allocated in society, right? So in America right now, we have a capitalist system. Like you get land if you pay for it. Okay. But in medieval, you're, in medieval England, like you only got the, you only got land if the king was your buddy. <laughs> so there's different ways to figure out who gets land. For how long do they get it? So in America, you get the land as long as you own it, right? Until you sell it or pass it to one of your heirs. But again, in medieval England, early in medieval history, uh, when you died, the land went back to the king, and then he got to give it to another one of his buddies. So you didn't get to, you didn't get to sell it. You didn't get to give it to your kids. So, how long do you get the land? For what can you use the land? What can you do with the land? What does land own, land ownership? What rights does that give you? In contrast, uh, what responsibilities does it give you if you own land? So, for example, in the United States, if you own land, you have a responsibility to pay your taxes, property taxes, right? You also have a responsibility not to use your land in a way that harms your neighbors. That's called a nuisance. There's a whole set of rules about that. Okay, so that's a responsibility. Another set of rules, how do you subdivide land, create new parcels, merge land, create fewer parcels, and adjust boundaries between land. Okay, How do you transfer land rights? So this isn't ownership of the, of the whole piece of property. It's just an individual right. So if I want to sell somebody a right, for example, to drive across my property, how do I give them just that right and not the ownership? In, mo in mo most cases in the United States, that's called an easement, okay? But it could be a lease or a license. So we got rules that tell us how to do that, how to break property ownership up into individual rights and then buy and sell and trade those rights. We talked about this in the last chapter. It includes rules about how you identify, describe, and mark land, right? Those are the survey rules, land title and survey rules. And then finally, rules about how you track ownership. Okay, so for, for example, in the United States, we have what's called the statute of frauds, which means transfer of real estate has to be in writing. Okay, and then we have this whole recording system where you got to go down and record it so you can give notice to everybody else that you bought it. And so there's a, a bunch of rules about how you track and transfer ownership of real property. Okay, so that is land tenure. It's this set of rules, and there's a lot of them about what you do with land. Okay, so second key concept is really pretty simple. It's a short one, but let's write it up here because it is important. Okay, so the second concept in chapter two, as land use intensity goes up, land delineation becomes more important. Let me explain that. There's a couple big words in there. So by land use intensity, we mean the more intensely the land is used. So we're typically talking about, you know, as we go from vacant land, just wild land to agricultural, that's a step up in intensity. As you go from agricultural land, let's say to Suburban homes, that's another step up in intensity, in intensity. As you go from urban homes to light industrial or retail, that's a step up in intensity. And then finally, when you get into a dense urban core with really tall buildings, you know, that's, that's the kind of the top of the land intensity use ladder. So as land use intensity goes up, as you're, as you're making more intense use of the land economically, uh, it becomes more important to be able to delineate or, or separate one piece of property from another. And there's a simple reason why. As land intensity, land use intensity goes up, the value of land goes up. As the value of land goes up, people are more willing to fight over it. And you got to remember, one of the whole reasons we developed this system of land tenure is so that people didn't fight with each other. You know, they didn't beat each other with baseball bats. So 
you avoid conflict when you can easily tell one one piece of parcel apart from another, when you can easily identify land rights and, and who owns them. Uh, we don't like systems where that stuff is confusing because it creates conflict, and conflict makes us poor as a society. So that's what we want to remember. Okay, so those are a couple key concepts uh, there for chapter two. Let's go over the third one. So here's your third concept. Okay, the third concept is that land tenure defines several type of land rights. Okay, so ownership of the underlying parcel is one type of right. That's an ownership right. There's other types of land rights. Okay, so I might have a right to drive across a piece of property. We mentioned that. I might have a right to harvest timber on a piece of property. I might have a right to mine for gold on a piece of property. I might have a, a right to drill for oil on a piece of property. I might have a right... Uh, I might have a right to have sunshine shine on my property. So those are all different kinds of land rights. Okay, so a land tenure system is going to define several types of land rights, and we're going to use the United States as an example. So we're going to look at what are some of the basic type of land rights that are defined in the land tenure system of the United States. Okay, so first we're going to talk about five, count them, five basic categories of land rights. Okay, and this just isn't just in the United States. It's in other places. Okay. Actually, I'm going to back up. That's the section ahead. Let me back up. So first, we're going to talk about what type of rights, some broad categories of rights, okay? So I'm going to list them here. We have sovereign rights, okay? And that just means the rights of the government. So what rights does the government have to land? Okay, so for example, United States governments can own land, they can tax land, and they can take land through the power of eminent domain when they want to, right? Okay. So those are sovereign rights. Then we have what we call rights in common, or communal rights. Okay. So for example, in the United States, uh, people have the right to navigate over uh, na uh, navigable bodies of water, so the ocean and Certain rivers, everybody has a right to travel on those bodies of water. Okay, it's a navigational right. That's a right in common. The right to drive your car down the road, that's a right in common. Okay, that's a right of way. Um, so we, we as a society define certain rights in common. Okay, or community rights. Okay, then we have rights held in the public trust. Okay, that's where the government owns the land, but can't, they, they can't act like a landowner. There's some aspects of that ownership that is restricted. We call that public trust. Um, and we, basically what that means is we don't trust our politicians. So we give them land to hold for the public, but we don't let them sell it uh, because politicians would sell that land to enrich themselves. And so, for example, in California, a lot of our tide lands are held in public trust. And we've decided in our legal system that that means the government controls that land you know, people have reasonable rights, the public has reasonable rights to access that land, but the government can't take that land and sell it to a private party. They have to keep it for us. It's held in trust for the public. Okay, it really means we don't trust our politicians. <laughs> All right, so then we've got uh, open access rights. Okay, and that, that means a right to just access the land without permission. Okay, and so to some extent, that's what we have with our national force in the United States. You know, most land in the western United States is federally owned. And uh, I get to go camping and hiking on my national forest land basically as I please. And, you know, they, I might have to pay a fee at a campground, and they might they may close certain parts of the, of the forest at certain times of year. But basically everybody has the right to access that land, open access. Okay, so those are four types of land besides private private land ownership rights. Okay, and then there's a couple, a couple sub-points they make here when they're talking about rights. Uh, one is, so I'm going to number these, one is land rights can overlap. So you and I can own uh, rights in a parcel that overlap one another. So for example, I might own the mineral right, the rights to subsurface minerals like oil or natural gas or uh, gold or copper, and you might own the surface rights and somebody else might own the airspace rights. So you can have three, three sets of rights stacked on top of each other, right? So we've got mineral, surface, 
and then airspace. Okay, we've been talking about a lot about airspace rights in the United States with the app and the UAVs, right? So how much air above your piece of property do you really own? Can you tell somebody they can't fly a drone over? It's an interesting question. Okay, so land rights can overlap. They can get stacked like that. Uh, they can complement one another. So uh, members of a family could, uh, so my brother and I could both, whoop, could both have ownership's rights in a piece of property. Those aren't in conflict with another, with each other. We, have, we own that together. It's called uh, tenants in common. So uh, you can have land rights in common with other people. You, they they complement each other. Same thing with an access easement. You know, multiple people can have the right to travel on an access easement. Those aren't conflicting uses most of the time. That the land is used together by more than one person. And of course, land rights can compete. So land rights can complement. We talked about that. So when land rights compete, that's the opposite of complement, right? That means you got more than one person trying to use the same piece of parcel, and those uses don't go together, right? Like you can't, you can't, and you can't both sleep in the same bed. <laughs> you know, usually if you're not married to somebody, they're not your close relative. You don't want them sleeping in your bed and using your bathroom. So there's some there. People can have competing competing rights to the same piece of property and we, we have to have a system that, system of the legal rules that help us to, to resolve resolve those conflicts, those competing interests. Okay, so now we're going to talk about uh, the five basic categories of land rights. So these are some different types of rights. Remember sovereign rights, rights in common, rights held in the public trust, open access rights, and of course we have private property rights. That's what we usually think about when we talk about land rights. Okay, then there's five basic categories the book talks about in chapter two of land rights. Okay, so I'm going to number those for you. We've got rights to use land. Okay, so I can have the right to use land, and, and that doesn't necessarily mean I own the land. So if I have an easement or a license or a lease, I have the right to use somebody else's land even though I don't own it. Okay, so we have rights to use of land. We have the right to transfer land. We kind of take that one for granted, but like I said, in medieval England, you didn't get to sell the land or give it to your kids. You had to give it back to the king. But in the U.S., we have the right to transfer or sell, convey. We have right to control the land. Okay. So I can control my piece of property. I can exclude others, other people from it. I can control what happens on it. Okay. And then... This is kind of one group here, right? Right to control, right to transfer, right to use. Then down below, I'll put four and five. I'm going to put these in a couple subgroups. So four are what we call formal rights. Those are rights that are recognized by the legal system. You can go to court to get these protected. Okay, and then we have informal rights. Okay, those are rights that we recognize as a culture, but may not be legally protected. So kind of cultural norms. I'm trying to think of an example. You know, if, if, if I stand in my backyard and look in my neighbor's bathroom window, um, you know, I might have the legal right to do that, but <laughs> it's not culturally acceptable. It's going to freak my neighbor out, right? So that's an example. You know, my neighbor has some informal rights to privacy there, just cultural norms. Okay. So that brings us to some types of rights to land, land rights that our legal system in the United States recognizes. So I'm going to give you another list of those and we'll talk a little bit about each one. All right. So this is types of the types of rights that we recognize in the United States. Okay. So we're going to start start with the first one. This is what we call fee simple absolute and we'll talk more about that when I go over the chapter one of Browns. But what it basically means is you've got the right, you're the owner. You own all the rights and you can give them away. Okay, so that's what we typically think about when we think about somebody owns a piece of property. We think about what we call fee simple absolute. Each one of those words means something. We'll talk about it when we cover Browns. Okay. And in the United States, we have easement rights. We talked about that. It's the right to use the land of another person even though you don't own that land. Okay, it could also be a lease right or a license. Okay. And actually, they separate out a lease here is the ability to 
live on a person's property or occupy it. Okay, we also call that renting. So you're going to occupy the land, could be for home or business, but you don't own it. It's a really important land right in the United States. Okay, and then we have a lien. A lien is a right to have a debt paid. So you can burden a person's piece of property. They can't buy or sell that property until your debt gets paid. So kind of right to land. A mortgage is kind of a, a special type of lien. So a mortgage is where you, you get a loan and your property is used as collateral. So if you don't pay your loan back, they have a right to take your land. It's, it's a conditional transfer. Okay, it's a mortgage. That's a type of right. Very important again, United States. And then we talked about this. We have uh, a right to use a common, so communal rights. Okay, so those are six different types of land rights we recognize in the United States. Okay, now the next concept in the book, chapter two of the book, is there's two different kinds of transfers. Okay, so fourth concept to chapter two, there are two, two types of transfers <clears throat> of, of land rights. And remember, we're talking about transfers. We're not just talking about ownership. We're also talking about land rights. So easements, things like easements. So there are willing and unwilling transfers. Willing transfer means the owner is a willing party. Unwilling means they're taking some right to your land and you don't get a say. So we're going to talk about those. <clears throat> There's basically two ways you can do willing transfers of land in the United States. One is with a deed. A deed is just a special name for a contract to sell somebody your land. Okay. And there's two, two basic types of deeds. There's a quick claim deed and a warranty deed. A warranty deed is carries some guarantee that you are actually own the land that you're selling somebody or the land right that you are selling somebody. A quick claim deed <clears throat> says whatever, whatever particular interest I have in this land right, I give it to you. I'm not promising you I have any, but if I do, I'm going to give it to you. We'll talk about later. Quick claim deeds can be used to clean up problems with land ownership and land rights what we call land title. Okay, so those are willing transfers by deed. The second type of willing transfer is by will. So that's when you somebody inherits your property. Again, we kind of take that for granted, but in medieval England, early medieval England, you didn't have that right. In the United States, you can pass property on to your heirs, your children, or others uh, through your will. Okay, so those are the two types of willing transfers by deed, written contract, by will. Okay. Now, there's a couple types of unwilling transfers of land. Okay. So this is when you're not a willing party. Okay. So that can be through con condemnation. That's where the government takes your land through the power of eminent domain. There can be adverse possession. That's what we call squatter's rights. That's when somebody gets your land because they've used it and you haven't stopped them. And then there's prescription, which is like squatter's rights, but instead of taking ownership of the land, they acquire a specific land right to do a certain thing with your property. For example, drive across the south 10 feet. Okay, so those are all unwilling transfers of land. Okay. All right, let's see. Last concept, number five. I'll try and fit it in here. Okay, number five, fifth concept for chapter two of land tenure is that there are legal restrictions on land use and transfer, especially in a place like the United States. What does that mean? Well, just because you own land doesn't mean you get to do whatever you want. So the government through the police power has the right to control what you do with property. Uh, you know, you, you can't put a slaughterhouse or an alligator farm on whatever property you want. You know, you can't put a house of prostitution next to an elementary school or a church. You know, there's just, there's certain rules that we use to control land use. So even though you own the land, you can't do whatever you want with it in most cases. So that's restrictions on use. We also restrict how you can transfer land. So we control when you can subdivide land, how you create new parcels. Uh, we have rules about how parcels have to be sold. We talked about some of the rules that you have to record your transactions. Um, you know, there's rules about who, who can, who can own property. You know, minor children can't own property, uh, without, without some guardianship. So there's other things like that, but so restrictions on how we use land. And then of course, restrictions on how we create parcels of land and transfer those. Okay, so those are the key concepts for chapter two of land tenure. It's, it's basically what kind of rules do we set up to govern land? That's land tenure 
Remember, when you take that set of legal rules and you combine it with a system to register land ownership and transactions, that's what I'm calling a cadastral system. And at the end of the book, they talk about some different types of cadastral systems. We'll get into that hopefully in a few weeks. Okay? All right. Hopefully that answered more questions than it created. Uh, I look forward to going over Chapter 3 with you guys. And uh, in one of my uh, videos I want to record in the near future, I want to go over Chapter 1 of Brown's. And we'll touch on some more of these concepts in Chapter 1 of Brown's. And we'll dive in a little deeper. We're going to talk some more about what Fee Simple Absolute is and the surveyor's role in the land tenure system and the surveyor's role when there's disputes. Remember, this whole system of rules is, is to help reduce disputes about land rights and land ownership and resolve disputes without physical violence. We'll talk about how, how the surveyor is involved.